In this tutorial, we'll be building our first synchronous circuit on an Intel FPGA. So the code I have already written, this is like the Hello World program for synchronous circuit. So basically, I want to blink an LED. Now, if you simply write a postage clock LED equal to not LED in simulation, you will see the signal is toggling. But if you really want to see a LED being toggled, uh, you need a minimum duration for which it should turn on and it should turn off. So I have used the approach of counter here. Again, we already had a tutorial on it. Please go back and refer. Now I want to keep the LED on for half the second and I want to keep the LED off for half the second. So you already know if I want to do something like that, we need to know the clock frequency at which our, uh, my circuit is going to run. Uh, for that, we'll have to refer again to the manual. So if you again look at any FPGA board manual, uh, there will be a section on uh, clock. So we need to refer there. So if you check that section, you can see there are four clock signals coming to the FPGA. Uh, all of them are 50 megahertz. There are additional clocks going to uh, specialized hardware blocks inside the FPGA that we are not worried at this moment. We are interested in the clock coming to the main FPGA fabric. So there are four of them all of them are running at 50 megahertz. So that's why at the top I define like my clock frequency is 50 megahertz. The total period is one second. That means I'll be keeping it on for half second or for half second. So all of those parameters I have uh, given as tick defines. Now again, remember these values, they are not calculated in the hardware during your circuit is running or something like that. No, all these are pre-calculated like the preprocessor directive uh, in your compiler, here quarters will be pre calculating all these values, means the width of the counter, the maximum value till which he should count all this information, and then he builds it. So let me first go and synthesize it. Now let him synthesize it. Meanwhile, we can do something. So I already mentioned when you are looking at a Velo code, you should be able to say what kind of hardware will be inferred by this particular description. So here you can see LED, I'm writing inside always block that automatically means it is the output of some kind of flip flop. So we have an LED here. And what is written here is if not reset, LED equal to zero. Okay, so I am using negative reset. Again, there is a reason for that. I'm planning to use the push buttons on the board these ones, so one of them. So I'm planning to use this first button as my reset. So when I press it, I need a reset. When I release it, uh, I need a normal operation. So again, you need to check what happens when you press the push button to decide whether you need post logic or negative logic. So from the figure, you can see if the button is not pressed, uh, there is a pull up resistor to VCC. So the input will be high if it is not pressed. If you press it, it will be connected to ground, so the input will be low. So it will be better to write uh, as negative reset, uh, as I mentioned, because I need reset whenever I press it. So we have a, a additional chip sitting in between, and this is basically for avoiding debouncing uh, whenever I use a mechanical switch. So that's the reason I have written not of reset here. So LED is the output and if reset is zero, LED is zero. So uh, that can be implemented like if this flip-flop has a synchronous reset, which is working on negative logic, we can directly connect it there. Then it is written uh, LED is not LED if counter is zero. That automatically means if counter is not zero, LED should return its previous value. So for that, we will need a multiplexer definitely and the output of MUX is going here. So the input to the MUX is the previous value of LED as well as the negated value from the LED. So that's what this logic means. So the control to the MUX is coming uh, from a comparator which is comparing the counter uh, with number zero. So we need a comparator here. That is what is controlling this one. So one input to the comparator is coming from the counter, which is again a bunch of flip-flops from the code you can see. So this comparator compares whether counter value is zero or not. So one input to the comparator is uh, zero. Other input to the comparator 
is coming from the counter. So let's look at the counter logic. So counter is also written inside always block left side. That means it's the output of flip-flop, but here it will be an output of a bunch of flip-flops. So let me just draw them like flip-flops. Okay, that is where it is coming from. Now the input to this flip-flop, again you can see there is a condition. If counter is same as timer value, it is zero. Otherwise it is counter plus one. That means we have a multiplexer there also, where all the input to the flip-flop is going. So let me draw it here. One input is zero, other input is counter plus one. So this is where our counter, so we'll have an adder here and we need to add one there and that is going as the other input to the max. Now the control to the max is basically, it is comparing whether counter equal to equal to this tick timer value. So we again need a comparator here one input to the comparator is this timer value, which is a constant, which can be built using wires connected to VCC or ground. After this expression is evaluated, other input to the comparator is the counter value itself. So we have counter value coming here. So that is what is going as other input to the comparator. And this is what is controlling this mux. Okay, so this is how I interpret this description. And this is the circuit which should be getting implemented based on this description. Now Quartus it has a good feature. You can actually find out what circuit is inferred by this description. So you expand your analysis and synthesis. Once you have done analysis and synthesis, after that you can double click on the RTL viewer and he will show you basically what circuit is being inferred by your description. So you can see it is very similar to what we have written. So this is the output flip flop from where the LED is going, so you can see it. The input to this flip-flop is coming from a MUX. One input to MUX is zero. Other input to the MUX is actually one of these, either the negative of this LED or the LED itself. So actually that is the MUX that I drew here. Okay, so what is this MUX doing? So you can see here, I assume the reset will be directly connected to the reset pin of the flip-flop. This flip-flop, has a reset, so here you can see S clear, which stands for synchronous clear here. That means this is a synchronous reset, but what Quartus is doing is he is permanently connecting it to zero. That means reset is never applied. Instead, what he did is he put a max here, and you can see one input to the max is zero. The other input to the max is the output of this max, which basically selects between LED of note of LED, and that is being controlled by reset. So whenever I make reset equal to zero, he will choose this zero, uh, which will make the output zero. So the logic is similar, but he did it slightly different way. So it appears like Okay, this is not very efficient because if we directly connected the reset here in SCLR, we could have avoided a multiplexer. But there is a certain reason for doing like this. So if you search like SC, okay, this is SCLR Intel, something like that. Okay, Intel FPGA, uh, you can see in the Q&A session why it is happening, okay, why does in quarters to synthesis use registers with SCLR. So there is a reason is given here. Uh, quarter synthesis does not implement registers with SCLR pin unless there are a minimum number of registers using the same synchronous clear signal. This behavior helps avoid poor utilization because only registers sharing the same synchronous clear can be packed into same LAB. So LAB stands for logical array block which is the basic building unit in Stratix FPGA. So in Cyclone, we have ALM, Adaptive Logic Module, basically same thing. So this is the reason. Okay? Uh, he will be packing during placement of route these flip-flops into same ALM. So unless they are sharing the same reason, they cannot be packed together. So actually this is uh, for efficiency, they are doing like that. Anyway, uh, the logic is exactly whatever we described. Instead of directly using it, he used a MUX and did it. So you can see the control to this MUX is coming from a comparator and the input to the comparator one is going from the counter. And here you can see he automatically found the width of the counter is 25 bits. Uh, from our expression here. Okay. 
counter with so log of time of value you found it like 25 now the input to the counter again as we have seen is coming from a multiplexer one input to the multiplexer is zero other input of the multiplexer is coming from an adder which is always adding the output with constant one here okay so this is a 25 bit adder like a built-in adder inside the fpga and again you can see another competitor who is comparing whether that value is uh, same as this tick timer value this one and he did the calculation and you can see what is the value there it is 32 hex 177840 so he is comparing it if they are same he will choose zero this one otherwise he will choose the output so it is exactly uh, whatever we described so for smaller circuits uh, this is a good feature you can always come to this RTL netlist and find out how the tool is interpreting your description and whether it is matching with whatever you are trying to do now there is one more netlist viewer under that you can see technology map viewer uh, this is actually showing how these flip-flops and the combination logic in in our RTL viewer will be actually mapped into the flip-flops and the lookup tables inside the FPGA. So here uh, you will see some more details. Every input will go through some kind of buffer. For example, here you can see clock is going through an IO buffer. So input buffers are used for mainly impedance matching. And same way you will see all the output pins. Uh, before the output pin there will be another buffer again IO buffer this is used as an output buffer this is mainly used for giving higher current drive to the output pins okay. so that is one thing our flip-flops are still there you can see in addition to that those adders comparators they are all implemented using lookup tables so these are lookup tables okay so some of them are five input some of them will be six input in the cyclone devices I, I think 6 is the maximum size of the LUT so you will not see anything with more than 6 input but anything less than 6 is also fine so if it is more than 6 input LUT again you will have to refer to my first video which I linked in the previous video about the FPGA architecture to really understand how a combination circuit is mapped into lookup table and how large combination circuits can be mapped by chaining multiple lookup tables so that you can see here okay so again these are all the flip-flops uh, for the counter there are how many where there there are 25 flip-flops you can see this is the ms bit of that counter again this is a good feature now if you have any state machine in your code we haven't discussed uh, fsm we'll discuss for any state machine uh, he will automatically detect it and extract it so under that case, uh, it will be coming here. As of now, it is empty because he couldn't find any state machine in your code. Now, after that, as usual, uh, you'll have to assign the pin. So we'll go to pin assignment. Here, yeah. I have already done the assignment. So no big deal, uh, like last time, reset, you will have to assigned to one of those push button I am using pin AA14 from the manual same way LED I am using V16 now clock again uh, if you look at the manual the pins will be listed here so you can see these are connected to pins AF14, AA16, Y26, K14 you can use any of them all of them are getting 50 megahertz clock now when you assign clock to that pin uh, for example, I am using a F14 and this is a 14 You can see there is a special symbol on that pin. It is basically saying this pin is clock capable pin. So unless our LEDs and buttons, your general purpose input output, clocks cannot be connected to any pin of the FPGA. So there are dedicated clock capable pins. Uh, clock should be connected only there. So that comes when you are actually building your own PCB, whenever you are connecting a crystal or an external oscillator, that should be always connected to a clock 
capable pin because these pins will be connected to the internal routing architecture of the FPGA and clocks are special signals uh, which has very high fan out as well as it should have minimum skew that's why uh, they are routed separately and they are connected to these special pins again you can see uh, here the clock signals are coming as pairs so this is actually capable of differential clock but they haven't connected it in differential way they have connected only to the positive edge uh, that is good enough so we can have only positive clocks here okay, uh, in this FPGA but in high-end FPGA in some cases you will need differential clocks in that case okay they will be connecting the differential clocks to a pair so in that case also you know you are connecting differential uh, it should be connected to the same pairs which will be next to each other you should not connect positive here uh, which is a positive pin for clock and negative here this is for a negative clock but this guy is not his pair these are pairs and uh, these are pairs i guess again you will have to look at the FPGA manual to find out uh, which are the pairs so we should do only like that okay so once this is also done remaining steps are exactly same uh, you can directly generate the uh, programming file after that we can program and see whether the logic is really working or not so here you can see the output once the program is put into the board uh, this LED zero is keep on blinking and whenever I press the reset button here it will stop blinking okay so there is a slight voltage at the FPGA pins I'm not sure it's because my grounding is not proper or not that's why you still feel like LEDs are glowing actually they are off and only when I release the reset button uh, it will start blinking if I keep it pressed as I mentioned it is connecting the input reset pin to ground so as per our logic LED will be at zero and I release it there is no reset so whatever we wrote uh, works okay so I hope uh, you have a better idea about implementing synchronous circuits on Intel FPG now you can go ahead and try other synchronous circuits that we have discussed in, in our previous video tutorials thank you